So, streaming has had profound effects on the media economy. So, back in the day, I used to pay for CDs. It cost about 15 quid for a CD. On that, you get average about 12 songs. Then, you get, I don't know, Pirate Bay comes along, all of a sudden, you can actually get music for free. That jolted the music industry into changing its business model. So iTunes comes along in 2003 and says, right, we're going to change the entire purchasing model of music here to try and combat piracy. So you can get any song now for 99 cents. You've reduced the margins considerably. But you can stream any song on your device forever on that. Now I pay $10 roughly a month for every song I could ever listen to in my entire life and I could never run out to them. It's insane. So, what has happened here, the on-demand economy, the idea that you pay for a media product and then that you have that media product, has gone. That on-demand economy now no longer exists. It exists, it still maintains in some ways, the video game industry, for example, still relies on the on-demand economy, but that will go in the next iteration of consoles. Nobody is going to buy games like that for much longer. Game stores are going to disappear, physical media for them will disappear, and this idea of purchasing one off is going to disappear. Easy, cheap, legal ways to own everything you possibly can now exist. What the consequence of that is, is that streaming companies have changed the way we consume culture. They've embedded us in a logic of capitalism that forces us to consume more stuff. And you might think, again, why is this, what, how has this got to do with social media? Well, this applies to how TikTok and YouTube operate as well. Basically, companies like Netflix take the information that they can get about us and push at us. So you start watching a program, what happens? A couple of days later is, because you watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Here's all these other programs which you can watch afterwards. And we'll keep doing this with everything that you watch. We will lock you in to this unending consumption. Because we've always got something for you to watch. There is always something else. And do you know what? If you did watch all that stuff, then you get a row that says, watch it again. <laughs> and we'll keep you watching. Because all these platforms have real-time data about what's being consumed, that changes then, eventually, what is produced. Netflix as a company is really interesting. It became a production company in its own right in the early 2010s. First program, does anyone know what programs it produced? The first two programs which became big hits? No? You guys are too young for this. House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. Now, those two programs were insanely successful. Netflix learned two valuable things. One, it could make stuff, and it was good, and, it, and you know, they could get an audience for it, and that's great. And it get new subscribers to it, to watch those programs. Huge, huge boom for Netflix. Two, it could start producing its own content to push the people as well. So as soon as you finish Orange is the New Black, you had a huge new way of actually understanding, you know, um, you know, what we need to create. Who are the people who are watching it was the most important thing. You understand who was actually consuming this content. I think, holy shit, we can make loads of content for these people based on the fact that they like this program. So you start to understand the audience in particular ways. This becomes what we call a cycle of viral production. You understand the audience in particular ways and start producing for them. So things that become viral hits become the basis for more stuff. This is not how creative processes worked in the past. So, was the net effect of that? Well, in terms of entertainment, platforms have now become the way that we consume entertainment. In the past, People like me would have thousands and thousands of CDs, for example. And I did, up until a few years ago. A vast library of CDs that I worked and paid money for, 
bought and put on shelves and look how much of a music geek I am, aren't I cool? No. And then, like, about ten years ago, I subscribed to Spotify. I was like, what is the fucking point of this? I'm not listening to these things anymore. They're taking up room. I'm never, ever going to use them. So I put them all in boxes and sent them to Music Magpie and got like a ten back or something like that. And Music Magpie probably pulled the whole lot. Basically, streaming does these things. Disintermediates and deacquisitions. We don't need to buy stuff anymore. I one of the examples of why this is really problematic is this. Sometimes you'll do a module in university and it's not on streaming services. And so a lecturer might tell you, oh, but the DVD is available in the library. There's only one problem with that. Most of you, I'd say 90% of you, don't own a DVD player. Lecturers can't get that in their heads. Because <laughs> they've all got DVD players in their front room. Some of them are still buying DVDs. They can't get their head around this. And they say, well, don't computers come with DVD drives? And not for about 15 years, they don't know. <laughs> There's some people can't get this in their head. They're like, this is dead? Because streaming has de-acquisition in society. We don't buy things like that anymore. It might be neat to have a vinyl collection. Sure, it looks cool, right? You know, and you, you can ponce about being a, like a vinyl guy, you know, and you know, probably get a fedora and vape really fucking heavily or something. I don't know what you do, right? But no, you don't need that. You don't need a vinyl collection. Right? Nobody needs it. It is that is a, now a piece of uh, what we call um, conspicuous consumption. You are being conspicuous in consuming that media because it says something about you as a person. Disintermediation means that we've cut out all the points in between. I don't need to go to a shop, pay hard-earned money for a CD, take it home, put it in the CD player to listen to the music I want to anymore. All I need to do now is install an app on my phone. And that's it. The friction between actually consuming now has disappeared. There is far less friction. So, because of that, what happens? I spend £108 a year on Spotify. What do I have to show for it? I have that thing that comes in December that says like your year on Spotify, which I put then on Instagram, ironically, so yeah, it's weird. So you might want to ask what this has to do with any of this. And it is this point here. Why is TikTok dominant? Because it is an unending consumption of ourselves. TikTok taps into the cultural moment of unending consumption by providing us unending content. But what we are consuming is us. It is endless, super fast, we watch, we consume, we repeat, we are consumed. As we decode messages, we re-encode them into the content we make or the content we comment upon. We are continually in a cycle of being made and remade, consumed and reconsumed at all times. TikTok matches the economic moment. It provides us with something which is unending. It provides us with something that we can never run out of. It provides us with something that gives us no tangible thing at the end of it. And it classically fits into the social networking paradigm because it encourages us to consume content about, ostensibly, us. What our interests are, who we are as people, we are looking for that content, and then if we choose to, we are making content which reinforces that afterwards. So we decode stuff, we encode it into other things, and we keep that cycle going. An endless, constant loop of things. So streaming culture, is all about the continual consumption of texts in contemporary society. That continual consumption leads to a win in terms of the attention economy. TikTok is dominant because it has cornered consumption. At the end of the day, consumption on TikTok is king. We keep on consuming stuff. 
We watch, we consume, we repeat, we are consumed. The classic model. That's what's profoundly depressing to me about trends on TikTok is that's exactly what they want you to do. That's the classic thing. You watch something, you consume it, you repeat it, you allow others to see it and they do the same. That's exactly the perfect thing that they want. What depresses me is that so many people actually do it. But I guess that's the whole point. What you need to think about if you're thinking about these platforms or your projects or your assets, think about surveillance, commodification, unending consumption, what we produce and who consumes it, and how platforms shape it. Those are always the key cardinal things with YouTube and with TikTok. How are you being watched? How are you being surveilled? How are you being quantified? How are you being, how is it unending? How can you never get out of it? How do they keep on pushing you content that you want to see? How the hell can I sit for an hour and three quarters, sit lie for an hour and three quarters this morning and not do anything? That's powerful stuff. Monday, drop in again for anyone who wants to talk to me about projects. Next Friday, I will do an additional project thing in this lecture. So the lecture should take an hour and ten minutes, something like that, and then the end part will all be about projects if you want to help. Okay? Have a nice weekend.